Eh, ora interviene Morten Blake Paulsen, che è segretario nazionale dell'International Council for Open and Distance Education. Eh, se non sbaglio, ha una formazione che non è di, di prima mano eh, in educazione, perché ha studiato anche ingegneria e quindi ci porta un'esperienza che è fondamentalmente sull'uso e sulle potenzialità delle tecnologie eh, per favorire i processi di educazione e valutazione. Grazie. Dear colleagues, for good morning. My name is Morten Lottebergsen and I have been working with online education for more than 30 years. I did actually teach my first distance online students in the fall of 1987. Now I have just recently become uh, the Secretary General of the International Council for Open <laughs> Distance Education but most of my career I have been working with online education in the private sector, private schools. And uh, the last few years I have been working as a founder of my own uh, distance education online school. And I will uh, talk about flexibility and cooperation assessment and quality in online education based on the experiences I have from these organizations over the years. I also have a part-time position as the, at the Norwegian uh, University of Science and Technology as a professor of online education. So ICDE, which I just started working for, is an organization that celebrates its 80th anniversary this year. We have about 170 institutions as members in uh, all around the world, as you can see on the map. Uh, we have, as far as I know, three Italian members. The organizations uh, have an estimated number of 17 million students. So many of these organizations are really, really large uh, distance and online education institutions. We have a global consortium of doctoral students that study the field of online education and distance education around the world. And uh, we have been supported with funds from the Norwegian government uh, for the last 30 years. So our secretariat, which I'm heading, is situated in Oslo. Uh, some of the experiences I will talk about uh, today is uh, related to my company, which I started in 2012. Uh, it's called NUA, the Nordic Open Online Academy, and it provides about 100 different online courses to users in 40 countries. Most of them are Scandinavian, understanding Norwegian or Scandinavian languages, but we also have some courses in English. This organization is uh, completely virtual. It means that we have no classrooms, we have no physical buildings. All the services are in the cloud. Uh, I have been working uh, with trying to research and argue that online education, especially for adult students, should be flexible. And I did uh, do I started my doctoral studies in the early 1990s at Kent State University and I have uh, most of that time after that uh, struggled with how we can provide online education that combines individual freedom with meaningful cooperation. And I have written a number of articles, reports and books on that topic. So, uh, I will start to talk a little bit about cooperation in online education. Uh, I would like that our students would, would feel that they have some sort of closeness or affinity 
to a learning community so that they can learn with other students. But especially adult students, which I've been working with, need individual flexibility because they have family and job responsibilities, so they need flexible flexibilities to study at their own convenience. So uh, I have four different um, uh, boxes there, and I start calling the first one rich individual learning, which has uh, little flexibility and little affinity to a community. It's basically individual learning controlled by the school. So we have some flexible individual learning, which is more controlled by the school. It gives little affinity to learning community, but large uh, individual flexibility. The old kind of correspondence schools dealt with that. Then we have the model which is used by many traditional universities and schools these days. We have collaborative learning which uh, requires the students to work in groups. The problem with collaborative learning is that you are very much relying on the other members of the groups. And if the students do not take part in the group work, it's a problem for the whole group. So I argue in my uh, research and in my practice that we should try to support cooperative learning uh, in online education, which takes place in networks, not in groups. In networks, we are not so depending on each other. We kind of reach out to the people that we know that can help us and we can share thoughts and experiences. And lately we have seen that this is very much supported by social media, that we can reach out to people in our networks and get help from them in our studies. So cooperative learning, as I want to promote this, takes a place in networks, not in groups. And uh, I talked about this many years before the social media actually came around and started to support this kind of networking very much. So, I also want flexibility in online education. And I have defined at least six different aspects of flexibility that I would like to promote. I will talk about some of them later on. And I think that students want this kind of flexibility, and I promote it. The problem is that the more flexibility you give to the individual student, the more difficult it is to have them work together or collaborate, because the more independence they have in time or space or place, the more difficult it is to actually make them collaborate. It's harder to collaborate if you are not in the medium at the same time, you're not at the same place and so on. So the challenge I have been working with is how can we find services and tools and support that promote both cooperation and flexibility. And that is the interesting challenge that I've been working with. For example, I found that many adult students want the freedom of space to study wherever they are. So by offering only online activities, both teachers, course designers and students can actually be anywhere that they have access to the internet. But I also would like our students and teachers to have freedom of time, meaning that they could have individual startups, not starting at the same time as all the other students. Because there are moments in life or careers that makes it difficult 
to start at the same time as the university or school wants you to start. If you give them the opportunity to start whenever they want, that is the flexibility kind I would like to promote. Uh, I would also allow them to have the freedom of place. This is an illustration, illustration of, of uh, collective pacing, where everyone has the same speed at the same time. This is the Norwegian individual pacing. You know the tracks and you can do it whenever you want, at your own speed and when it's convenient for you. So I promote this freedom of pacing as well. Uh, in one of the uh, former uh, jobs I had, we developed a learning management system in which all the students could develop their own individual progress plans. Here is a, a screenshot in Norwegian, but you can see that this student actually has four courses online that uh, the person is doing. And uh, the thing here is that all the assignments that you can see are listed here. The students have uh, entered his own planned submission dates. And the systems then follow this up by uh, tracking when the student actually delivered the submissions. Those are the greens here. They have been delivered. And uh, the blue ones are the ones that are planned for the future. This is back in 2011, so it's a long time ago. And the yellow one was planned but is delayed. So the system followed up each of the students on their own individual progress plans. Uh, we can also use this kind of flexibility to what I call micro-guest lectures, which I have been practicing quite much uh, in the teaching of my master students lately. Uh, it is very easy, much more easy than I expected, to invite guest lecturers or experts actually from around the world to give short 15-minute presentations to my students, inviting them to come over during a video conference call, and I say, can you, one of the Wednesday this semester, actually give us a presentation about what you're working with? And almost everyone I ask say, yes, I can do that. It's just 15 minutes, and I can talk with whatever I want to. And then I ask my students to read something that the expert has written and then they ask expert uh, questions. And this is also flexibility regarding how to get guest experts into the classroom. Then I have been teaching master students for the last uh, three years, and I often start to ask them, do you prefer linear TV or streaming TV? Streaming TV may, for example, means watching Netflix or, or things like that. And somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of my master students, who are about 25 years old, say that they prefer streaming television so that they can see whatever they want, whenever they want it. They do watch complete seasons of a series throughout, through one single weekend, for example. Okay, so, so they agree, we prefer streaming television to linear television. And then my next question is, do you prefer linear education or streaming education? And then they start to look at each other. Uh, because I invited that term when I first uh, presented the question, and they kind of started to ask each other, what is streaming education? And that 
have started a lot of interesting discussions. Because if you perceive education as they perceive linear or uh, streaming television, then you come up with a lot of interesting <coughs> questions for the future time. Uh, so they kind of start to think, what if linear TV is geriatric and linear education old-fashioned? What if digital natives prefer streaming TV and streaming education? And then we came up with a number of, of uh, things, which is uh, this uh, sequence of the next uh, slides. Starting when it suits you and providing the time you need. Imagine streaming education allowing you to change sequence of lessons and to study on fast forward. Imagine streaming education where you can learn at your own time. Have vacation when you wish and decide the time of your exams. That is the kind of flexibility that could be when you are starting to think about education as a streaming television. But why is education still linear? And of course there are many, many, many reasons for that. But I wonder now whether distance education as we have known it for the last decades is becoming less flexible as mainstream education becomes more flexible. Let's uh, look at assessment. I have uh, basically used four types of uh, assessments in my online courses. Computer-based, self-assessment, peer assessment and teacher assessment. And uh, I try to, to combine as many of these uh, methods in my courses as possible, both face-to-face -face and online. And I found that I have been promoting transparency a lot, meaning that we can see information about others and online education provides a lot of, of opportunities for that, which is a challenge, I will come back to that. But if students can get some information about the results of others, which is possible in online courses, then we can allow the students to compare themselves with others, learn from others, and maybe uh, having tools and services for these uh, assessment methods can uh, help us for future learning and assessment. I haven't time to go deeper into this. But also, uh, teachers can learn from it other. And uh, eight years ago, I worked for an institution in Norway called NKI, which was a large, uh, Scandinavia's largest online education institution at that, that time. And we introduced uh, a system for peer evaluation for all our about 100 online teachers. And what we actually did was to uh, randomly pick out uh, feedback that the teachers gave on student submissions and sent them to a colleague for evaluation and to allow the other teacher to give feedback on the, the, the way the teachers dealt with the students. And um, Professor Epila, who was leading this uh, survey, he concluded that they perceived it as motivating and informative. They also reported that they learned at least as much from giving feedback as they did from receiving feedback. So, 
that was a successful uh, experiment. We also uh, test and ask the, the teachers to do self-evaluation. We picked out randomly some feedback they gave to their own students and asked them later to comment on how they actually did that. And when the, the, the supervisor asked them to do the self-evaluation, they did that and they said they learned a lot from that as well. I will talk a little bit about quality. Uh, all the surveys that I have been doing and a lot of the research I have read say that online students are very concerned with at least two issues. They want swift feedback from their teachers, not having to wait for a long time to get the feedback. And they want quality feedback with really value, good information so they can learn from it. So swift feedback and quality feedback is very high on the students' list of quality teaching. And what we see now is that in most countries there are uh, offices that deal with national standards, quality standards, uh, reviewing institutional quality work, and uh, that is very good in many ways. But they often are a challenge for institutions that would like to offer innovative, flexible online education. Because in most countries, uh, stand, all the standard bodies are headed with people that have their tradition in the traditional universities or school systems. And uh, to have high quality, they perceive you should do education as has been done in traditional universities. So, Sometimes I see or feel that these quality standards and quality bodies are doing a lot of good work, but they kind of reduce the flexibility and opportunities for innovation, which we also need. Uh, how much time do I have now? I can continue for a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have worked a lot with uh, the issue of transparency or privacy in online education because we know that the technology, the learning management systems and all the other systems we are using can block a lot of information about us. This is related to learning analytics, for example, all the information we actually can keep about both the teachers and the students' activities. And this is interesting and controversial. Should we be transparent or should we have some privacy? And uh, if there is no transparency, it's not really any interesting things out there. We can't see anything. So some sort of transparency at least could uh, be interesting. And I will argue that transparency improves quality. And here is a cartoon I made about this. Because I found that when we offered students access to information we have about them in our databases, and uh, all kinds of information that we make available for students, then they come back and say, this is not correct. The first time we offered uh, the students to see their telephone numbers online, they said, uh-uh, I moved from home, I have a new telephone number. And it also has some sort of preventive quality. If teachers and students know that other students or other teachers see what they provide 
online, they will improve the quality because they know it's online and other people can review it later. And we also see that if students allow other students to see their work, they can learn from each other and they can discuss from each other. So uh, obviously transparency uh, has an opportunity to improve quality. At the same time, I would like to say that transparency promotes cooperation. Because if you have some information about the other students that you are studying with, or the other teachers that you are studying with, it, uh, it's much easier to cooperate and contact them. Um, I did teach uh, at the Universidad of Abacta for one year as a visiting professor living in Portugal. And uh, I taught a uh, master class with uh, all my students, and we met only once during that year, and this is a picture of me with my Portuguese students. And they hated it when they realized that uh, they would have a teacher that did not understand Portuguese, so they had to uh, read and write English to communicate with each other and me. And we did a lot of, of uh, innovative uh, tasks. And, and basically, I uh, encouraged them to be as transparent as possible and share with each other uh, the learning tasks they did. And I said that they could decide by themselves whether they would be very private to send the assignments to me personally by private email, so that only I and the students actually saw their work. Or I said we could use the class forum in Moodle to share our assignments and our work. Or I said we can have a high transparency level and use the global word, uh, web services to publish our work so that everyone can see what each of you are doing. And to my great surprise, almost all of them put <coughs> all their coursework in open global media so that they could see it. But the things that happened was that, well, students in other classes at the university start to comment on the work, then other people at the faculty start to comment, then uh, people at other Portuguese communities started to get involved in our courses, and then I also introduced uh, what I call the one question interview, saying that you should read an interesting article and ask the author of this article one question, and they contacted these uh, experts around the world, and they got answers and they posted these answers on their open media. And suddenly, students and experts from all around the world started to comment on this. So we had a very scary experiences with uh, a very open classroom that actually was available for everyone to get into. And it was scary for me because, as you know, not all the students are excellent, and they do not produce the best results all the time, and they refer to me as their professor. So this was an interesting and scary experience. But my point is that being transparent allowed us to reach out to a lot of people and learn from each other in a network. And that is something I would like to encourage as long as the students themselves can decide whether they would like to go on with it. So that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Guido, abbiamo avuto molti stimoli che vanno in una direzione di innovazione.
dimensione che spinge ad essere eh, conservatori ed è la paura dei rischi che l'innovazione eh, comporta. Abbiamo imparato che è importante il rapporto diretto con i nostri studenti e che quindi molto passa dalla comunicazione viso a viso. Abbiamo eh, avuto esperienze anche positive di questo. Eh, C'è un libro molto interessante di un, di un chirurgo, Arthur Gawend, che è tradotto in italiano si chiama Salvo Complicazioni. In questo libro lui racconta una cosa che, che dà un po' i brividi, ma a un certo punto nel suo ospedale si utilizzava un metodo tradizionale di operazione al cuore, che dava un numero di risultati all'epoca abbastanza positivi, più del 50% dei pazienti eh, riuscivano a sopravvivere. A un certo punto venne fuori un modello innovativo di operazioni al cuore, per cui decisero di tentare il modello innovativo. Lo tentarono per i primi sei mesi e purtroppo il numero di morti sotto i ferri aumentò significativamente. Per cui la valutazione degli effetti a breve avrebbe portato a rinunciare immediatamente a quel sistema. Ebbero il coraggio di continuare per altri sei mesi e il numero di pazienti che sopravvivevano prima arrivò di nuovo al 50% e poi arrivò al 75%. E quindi da quel momento quel tipo di operazione dedicata al cuore aveva il 75% di successo perché nella prima fase eh, erano aumentati i casi eh, di morte, perché i chirurghi stavano imparando, perché i chirurghi stavano imparando. Per cui se noi abbiamo paura di imparare e, e qualche volta imparando sbagliamo, eh, smettiamo di imparare, ritorniamo indietro e continuiamo a fare morire il 50% delle persone sotto terra. Se noi abbiamo il coraggio di imparare, corriamo dei rischi, facciamo degli errori. Questo eh, comunque rimanda al fatto che la valutazione richiede anche dei tempi. Oggi c'è una grande fretta di misurare i risultati, di misurarli subito, di misurarli 5 minuti dopo l'intervento. Eh, è rischioso, bisogna... Uh, avere il coraggio di valutare, 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 ma di farlo continuativamente nel tempo, avendo anche il coraggio di assumersi i rischi che sono tanti quando facciamo scelte in un contesto complesso uh, come quello educativo. Bisogna ringraziare le persone che hanno il coraggio di innovare.